All right, welcome Comp 3512 students from Web 2. This is the COVID-19 special. Um, uh, I'm much more happy pacing in front of a, uh, a blackboard, telling jokes, doing stuff from my memory. I don't really enjoy using PowerPoint, but it is what it is. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cover most of the material from chapter 14 that you'll need to know. I'm going to split it up into a series of presentation, a uh, series of videos, just because I think my license only allows me to do a 15 minute screen capture, uh, a screencast at a time. So let's go. My apologies for all the ums and ahs that are no doubt going to show up. My apology if I'm talking too loud, talking too quietly, I'm not really sure. Here's the content that we're going to cover. We've already covered in class in our last lecture, uh, our last live face-to-face -face lecture, we looked at number one, two, and three. Um, I'm going to cover them again just because I've got the, the slides here. Look, every website beyond uh, the really trivial examples we've done in the first two labs typically make use of some type of data source. So working with databases is, a, is an absolutely essential part of any kind of real, um, not just PHP, but Node or any kind of real database <clears throat> um, website. In fact, your first assignment, right, which was JavaScript only, it was using a server-based data source. That's the, the API that you were consuming. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. Databases provide a, a way to implement one of the more important, in fact, I'd say it's one of the most important software design principles that there is, which is separating that which varies from that which stays the same. What does that mean exactly? Well, let's take a look at these two, what appear to be two different pages. Um, they have the same design, but the specific content changes, right? This is the British Museum. This is the Brandenburg Gate. This is in London. This is in Berlin. This one was taken by Michelle Brooks. This one was taken by Mark Taylor, etc. Well, if we actually look at the file name, it's the same file. So in fact, this is the same page, right? The design stays the same, but what varies is the content. Using databases allows us to, to implement such things. So let's actually look at uh, the big picture, or I don't know, is this a big picture or is this a small picture? I'm not sure. Let's look at, let's take a look at a little bit more detail. So maybe <clears throat> we have a browser that's making a request for PHP resource that has query string parameters. On that last page you saw the it was called displayimage.php and there's a query string parameter it says okay i want to see this image well it goes to our web server and the web server shuffles it off to php based on the extension the page gets executed and perhaps at some point in this page it constructs an sql query let's just say select star from images where id equals 19 why 19 well that was what was passed to us in the query string that query then goes to something called a database API, which is in a sense part, you can see here, I visualized it as part of PHP. The API's job is to send that query that we've programmatically constructed to the database management system. What's the database management system? It could be Oracle, it could be MySQL, it could be something else. The database management system has got the job of actually retrieving the data from the database, and it also has the job of returning the, re uh, the, the result of our query back to the API. <clears throat> the API will give the data back to our PHP page, or your PHP page, let's say, if, when you start writing these PHP pages to um, retrieve data from a database. Like any PHP page, ultimately it generates HTML that gets sent back to the um, through the response stream back to the browser, and the browser displays it. So that's kind of um, 
the, the life cycle, if you will, of how websites use databases. So let's learn a little bit more about how to do this. Oh, <clears throat> look, I'm not going to teach database 101. You've got another course for that, right? But let's just a quick refresher. Remember, we've got records or rows, field names, each. Um, <clears throat> there's typically a primary key field. You can draw diet tables in different kinds of ways. Tables are linked in a relational database system via foreign keys. So a foreign key in one table is typically the primary key in another table. Databases are, are used everywhere in web development. So perhaps our public web servers making use of MySQL, maybe backend intranet uh, systems are making use of different types of databases. Um, maybe commercial point of sale systems going through a browser make use of databases. Inventory systems or manufacturing systems might are no doubt using um, databases. Um, different types of services are using databases. Even mobile applications um, make use of databases. So databases are everywhere. All right, SQL. The select statement is what we'll be mainly using, right? Select field names from table name. You can use a wildcard, though as it says here, while it's convenient for, you know, for testing or doing stuff on the blackboard or in labs, for production code, we typically don't use it. We want, uh, we only want to retrieve the data that we actually need. So we typically don't use this, the asterisk. Remember, you can change the sort order via order by, you can um, get just particular records by specifying uh, using the where clause to get a criteria and specifying a criteria. Do recall that when you want to compare something to a string, you need to put use string literals, while uh, numbers don't need that. The join statement, again, I'm not going to reteach that. I find most students uh, in Web 2 have almost completely forgotten how to do an inner join, and I guess that's fine, but you, you will have to relearn it. Check your notes, I guess, or Stack Overflow or whatever resource that you use. Group by is a, um, a way to, another way to reduce the number of records. Typically, you use group by because you're trying to do a count or a sum or some kind of an aggregate function. Selecting data is not the only way we work with databases. We can also insert data, update data, delete data. And again, many students tend to forget the syntax for an insert or forget the syntax for an update or forget the syntax for a delete. And I guess that's fine. You just have to, as long as you know how to look it up when the time comes. For things like <coughs> quizzes and exams, um, we'll probably stick with select statements and while you won't have inner joins on an exam, I will expect you to know how to do, how to use the where clause and an order by, select from. That I will expect you to have had memorized and be able to use in an exam situation. As I mentioned, initially our examples will mainly focus on retrieving data, that is select queries. but but it is important to remember that um, inserts and updates and deletes are important. And indeed, most websites at some point also need to modify data, right? For instance, like registering a user or submitting a comment or a rating or ordering an item. All of those tasks require update and insert um, queries as well. Sites that do modify data often need an, to add a layer of complexity to ensure that data remains consistent. As you can see, it's got a little subtitle here of transactions. And you may or may not have learned much about transactions in your previous database class. Let me say a little, a, a little bit about transactions. So why do sites that modify data need this extra level of complexity? Well, imagine the scenario. Right? A user makes a purchase on an online store, 
and then um, and that what has to happen behind the scenes is the PHP code needs to add records to two separate table uh, tables and update a third right maybe insert into an orders table and then it, for each item being uh, that's part of that order do an and an, an, an another insert into this other table and then when it's all said and done update the inventory table okay question what happens if the web server crashes after it th completes this first line well we've got data that's not consistent and that's a real problem the solution is to make use of database transactions. Um, the textbook calls these local transactions, and so I'll um, be able to, you can use either of these terms. But all database modifications within a transaction will only be saved if they all work. That's an important part of most real-world databases on, on the web. So um, in terms of the SQL, we typically make use of something called transactions. So we say, look, start this transaction, then do our various SQLs that are part of this. And if we get to all of this, then commit it. That will make sure, the database management system will make sure that all those statements are executed. If something goes wrong, then we want to roll them back. While we won't make use of transactions in our course examples, just because we're kind of just trying to get an overview of how to do things. Um, we won't see this in our practical stuff for the assignments or in the labs. I do expect you to know what transactions are and why they're important. Indeed, in the web world, some transactions are even more complicated than this. Some transactions involve multiple systems, multiple servers, some of which you might have no control over. For instance, take what might be involved to do a purchase in an online store. We might have to modify the local databases used for the site. We might have to check with the financial service to ensure that the payment was improved. We might have to modify this inventory system. Maybe it's a, the inventory system is separate from the web system. We might have to send a message to a shipping provider. Like We have control over some of this, but we don't have control over all of it. So in such a case, we'll have to make use of another type of transaction known as a distributed transaction. Now, distributed transactions are kind of cool, um, but they're complicated. So in this example, we can see like oh, all sorts of things going on. What this is trying to show is different servers, different things doing different things. So here's maybe, let's say this might this one here might indicate our web store. So we might have our own local transactions, but we're working with other things, maybe a financial system here and maybe a shipping system here that we have no control over. And so we use a specialized piece of software called a transaction manager to um, help us with this. We, of course, in this intro course, will have nothing to do. We won't get a chance to use this. In fact, I've never used a transaction manager. It's a very specialized piece of software. Um, and quite complicated to set up from what I've been told. Um, but what I would expect you to know, let's say in an exam, is to know that there are local transactions and distributed transactions and why they're both necessary. All right. Well, if we talked about SQL, we should say a few words about NoSQL. So NoSQL, as it says here, is a different way of thinking, right? We've got relational design where we we split information up into normalized tables to reduce um, um, information being repeated. But in a NoSQL database, it's hierarchical. It's kind of based on key value pairs. Popular options are things like Mongo or AWS Dynamo uh, DB. Um, and they typically don't use SQL. Well, they don't, they don't use SQL. That's why they're called NoSQL databases. So Mongo, for instance, uses JavaScript. This might look a little uh, frightening, but really it's just a, a JavaScript syntax for a kind of normal bit of SQL. All right, that's it for that. We're going to continue number four in, a, in the next video.